TJ said, my name is Aviv and I'm a system software engineer here at Grok. Um, I've been at Grok coming up on about two years now. Uh, and during that time, I've worked primarily on the software infrastructure that allows us here at Grok to build, uh, whoops, our large scale inference engine. What is going on? Anywho, okay, um, to build our large scale inference engine. Um, so my talk today is gonna be about the Grok runtime. And this runtime is used by Grokflow under the hood to run models, as well as being available to you as a developer as a standalone tool to, um, to program other custom models that might not be part of Grokflow um, using this runtime. Uh, runtime is a bit of an overloaded term. So I'll further specify what I mean in a slide or two. But before I get to that, kind of like how Hatije and Murali mentioned, I'd like to keep this as interactive as possible. So if, if anyone has any uh, any questions while I'm talking, feel free to chime in or interrupt me, and I will do my best <clears throat> do my best to answer you. Um, additionally, with the release of LLMs, Grok has you know put a lot of work into updating our runtime to support uh, running LLMs with our chip with our chips. Unfortunately, I'm not going to really cover super in-depth detail about these uh, runtime specific changes for LLMs. But at the end, or maybe in a previous presentation or a, a coming presentation, I'll be able to give a high level of, uh, of what we're doing. So with that said, let's begin. Uh, so first, I'll talk about the runtime hardware and software architectures as they relate to Grokflow, which I think you are all familiar with from a previous presentation or just from having used it. Um, and in this section, I'll just talk about the various components in a simplified version of our runtime architecture. Um, I'll talk about our runtime, our driver, our IOP file format, which is the file format um, we use to program Grok chips and other related system components. Uh, second, I'll talk about the ways you as a developer might want to use uh, our runtime to program Grok chips or Grok, a, a Grok chip or Grok chips, depending on the model you're trying to, uh, to run inference on. And finally, if time allows, I will give a kind of low level um, diagram low level explanation of what is actually happening between the host cpu and you know one or more grok chips during inference time so i hope that sounds good and we will keep going um so before i go any further in my talk i also want to just define what i mean when i say runtime putting it as simply as i can the grok runtime is a higher piece is a higher level piece of software that's running on the host CPU inside of a Grok node. Uh, this runtime software communicates with whatever Grok hardware you're using over a VFIO-based driver we've written. And this driver um, facilitates communication between the host CPU and the Grok chip or Grok chips over a PCIe interface. Um, this runtime deals with information in our .iop files, which are kind of like the, the executable file for Grok chips. Um, and these IOPs define inputs and outputs to, uh, of, of your model. Um, this picture is quite busy, but, uh, don't stress about that. In the next few slides, we'll go through piece by piece, and I'll just briefly touch on each block that is relevant to the runtime presentation. So, um, on this slide, again, I think you, you've seen this, pres this, uh, this diagram before, but this is a simplified diagram of what using Grok for, Grok flow would look like um, on Grok hardware. So as you can see, uh, Grok flow is composed of different system components, the compiler, assembler, and Grok runtime. Uh, so like I mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the runtime block. Um, and when you're using Grok flow as a developer, you aren't directly using the runtime, but under the hood, you know, Grok flow is definitely using our runtime uh, software in order to run your model on our hardware. Um, anyway, this diagram currently combines many sub subcomponents of the runtime together. So to peel back the layer of the onion or a layer of the onion, so to speak, I wanna show you this kind of diagram that I made and I showed you earlier. This diagram breaks up more of the system components that compromise the, the Grok runtime. And to further simplify, um, I'm only going to be talking about the, the boxes or the components that I've highlighted in Grok Orange here. So with that said, let's gonna, I'm going to walk through each component step by step, 
and just kind of explain what they are and how they relate to to how you as a developer would, would run um, inference on Grok. So the Grok runtime, like I mentioned, is a higher level software interface to Grok hardware. It has an idea of what an IOP is and what it contains. And it basically parses these IOP files, initializes your Grok chip with any weights and, and data. And it'll uh, deal with allocating input and output buffers for the data going onto the Grok, uh, to your Grok card and coming off of it. And we have C++ and Python based implementations to fit in with whatever, uh, whatever better suits your code needs. So uh, I talked about the Grok runtime and to show that we've talked about it, I'm just gonna put a little check mark there so we can slowly break down this diagram. Uh, the next thing I wanna talk about are the IOP formats. Um, so like I've mentioned before, these are the, um, this, an IOP is emitted by the Grok assembler or Grok compiler. Uh, which Philip was talking about just a second ago. And these would be um, analogous to like a .elf file or an a.out file on a CPU. Um, so then IOP is basically the weights, um, it is the compiled and scheduled program that can be executed on our hardware. So it contains all your model weights and expected inputs and outputs of running your model. Uh, now we can check off the IOP box and move on to another system component of interest, the, the driver. So this is a piece of software that's running on the host CPU. And this is kind of directly the interface between the host CPU and the Grok card over a PCIe interface. Um, the driver is primarily uh, involved in DMA transfers to and from the Grok chip, um, as well as handling some reading and writing of control status registers. Um, it's kind of the lowest level software we have before we get into the, the Grok LPU domain. Moving on. Um, there are many different kind of types of hardware we have um, th and that we offer. We have a singular Grok LPU, which is packaged up into a Grok card. So one Grok, it's a PCIe form factor. I can't remember the exact dimensions, but one card has one Grok LPU. Um, we scale up eight Grok cards into what we call a Grok node. Um, so this picture on the uh, bottom left is a Grok node where there are eight different Grok cards in there along with an x86 host CPU. And then we combine nine Grok nodes, excuse me, together into what we call a Grok rack. And we have um, nine different nodes in here all networked together over our proprietary C2C interface. Uh, so covered the hardware. And the, the last little bit is talking about the host CPU and PCIe. Uh, nothing super special here that we're doing. It's just a, a basic x86 uh, server class CPU. And then we're running it uh, PCIe Gen 4 uh, by 16. Um, and with that, uh, we've covered all the major system components that com uh, com comprise the Grok runtime. And you should now have an OK high level understanding of what each um, component in this block diagram does and how it uh, creates the overall runtime. So shifting gears a little, how would you as a developer interact with the runtime outside of Grokflow? Let's say there's a model that isn't supported with Grokflow for some reason, or you wanna do something very custom, you would need to use our runtimes directly. Um, and this is something kind of confusing that I'll try and clarify directly right now there is more than one Grok runtime. So far in my talk, I've been talking to you like there's only one runtime for every single application, um, which isn't necessarily the case. Depending on your current needs, you know, be that ease of use or high performance, there are different runtimes that you'd wanna use. So in the next few slides, I'll go over the different runtimes we have and the when you'd wanna use each. So here I'm just highlighting the components that you should be focusing on uh, for the rest of this section. Um, and the first major distinction between which runtime you should use is whether you are um, using C++ or Python. Uh, both the C++ and Python versions of the runtime can offer similar performance. Um, the driver is, uh, our driver is natively, natively written in C++. So um, the C++ runtime interacts directly with that. Um, versus the Python runtime, 
interacts with the driver via what's called an FFI or a foreign function interface. Um, so these two down here are fairly kind of low level, low-ish level um, runtime solutions for you. But we also have um, this TSB runner that we call, which is not as high performant, but is much, much easier to use. You just kind of point it towards your IOP files and your inputs and outputs, and, and it, it abstracts away the rest. Um, so it's great for a quick proof of concept. Um, and TSB runner, I believe, is what is used currently when you run Grokflow uh, to, to compile and run a model. Um, and like I said, if performance is kind of more of your what you're after, the C++ runtime or the Python runtime should be what you're using in deployment. Uh, both of those give you finer grain control over your model performance and hardware, really allowing you to extract more performance. Uh, the only trade-off is that you need to have a little bit of a deeper know-how of what, what's going on on the chip, the Grok LPU, to be able to really fully use. So uh, both types, the performance versus ease of use runtimes, are very viable, just a, a trade-off to consider. Uh, so with that said, um, I'm now going to move into kind of the specifics of what happens when you're we're really running an inference on a Grok chip. So what, how does data get shuffled from the host CPU to the LPU and then back to the host CPU once the LPU has finished its processing? Um, so for this example, let's say we want to run an image classification model, let's say ResNet 50. Um, so on the left, we'll start out with an input and output buffer that we've already allocated in our code. So this is in the host, host CPU's memory, this left side here. Um, and looking at the input buffer, this kind of rainbow um, collection of vectors can be assumed to be like a, a, the picture we want to run inference on. Let's say it's a cat picture that, um, that is stored in our host CPU memory. Uh, and the output buffer is currently empty, but we'll fill that once we're done with our inference. So the first step that happens when performing an inference on the Grok LPU um, is transferring the data from the input buffer to the Grok LPU. So how do we do this? Uh, we do this via a DMA transfer between the Grok chip, um, a DMA transfer between the Grok chip um, using something called the DMA descriptor. For brevity, I won't go over DMA very much unless there are any questions. Um, but we set up what's called a DMA descriptor, which is effectively like a scatter list, which is a data structure that is set to map these chunks of memory to the input buffer. Um, when, so, so we map these input buffer uh, vectors to these DMA descriptors. And when we want to kick off an inference, we have the Grok driver write the first DMA descriptor location. So this kind of the, the address of this first box gets written into the PCIe block of the Grok LPU. And when that DMA block inside the PCIe chip, when the DMA buffer inside the PCIe block um, detects that a DMA descriptor has been written to it, the Grok chip will initiate a DMA transfer of the input buffer data via these DMA descriptors from the host CPU to the Grok chip. So like I mentioned, the DNA master in the Grok chip will you know, pull down, read or pull down data from the host CPU and will start filling this FIFO on the Grok chip. And as this data is copied over from the host CPU's input buffer, the, a, a data in a receive, like a, a receive buffer is filled um, on the Grok LPU. So here we've read three of the uh, seven input vectors in this kind of contrived example. Um, and this slide is also to show that as we're simult as the Grok LPU is reading from the host CPU's memory, we're simultaneously shifting that data into the chip at specific SRAM locations um, that have been defined in your IOP file. So these little empty blocks, we can pretend are SRAM locations on the chip that uh, need to be loaded with our input data. So we you know, have read and shifted all of our input data onto the chip. We can now run our compute program uh, which just means we're running uh, our input data through our model weights. So we run the program, and then uh, it was kind of a subtle difference. Some of these SRAM locations were empty, and now they're filled, which is to represent the output data that's stored in SRAM locations on the Grok LPU. 
and to get this uh, data off of the chip back to the host CPU so we can tell you if it's a cat, a dog, whatever, um, we do basically the reverse of what we did to get data onto the chip. So the Grok chip will move the output data from SRAM to a different FIFO in the PCIe block. And then to extract uh, output data from the chip, the driver writes a different DMA descriptor address to the PCIe block. Um, this step actually happens immediately after the driver writes the, the DMA descriptor for the input. Um, so this isn't you know, totally sequential. Um, and at that point, this, the, the data transfer will occur. The data is moved back to the host CPU memory. And you can you know, pro like do whatever you want with that result. Um, and your, you know, your inference has been completed. Um, so that is that. Are there any questions I can answer now about the kind of basic level runtime that I've discussed here? Yeah, there have been some questions in the chat that I was able to get to. Um, just one from uh, Mauricio. He was asking if one Grok Grok is equivalent to one Cerebrus CS2 uh, in terms of aggregated performance, um, FP16 and FP16. Yeah, um, I, I don't know uh, Mauricio, unfortunately. I, I don't know a ton about the uh, Cerebrus wafer scale engine, uh, aside from kind of high level uh, specifics on it. No worries. Hopefully, uh, Mauricio, um, maybe we can get back to you for that question with an answer. Going to do some digging on the side. I think okay. that's it for questions as far as I can see in the chat. Okay, great. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, for being here and for listening.